Welcome to the Exhale Podcast, a candid conversation about current matters relating to respiratory, diagnostic, and lung health. Today's hosts are Mark Russell, Marketing Communications Manager, and Troy Bridgen, Executive Vice President of Sales and Operations for Vitalgraph in North America, a global leader in respiratory diagnostics. Today, we talk with Kevin Carney, a nurse practitioner and the director of the Temple Health Lung Center Service Line and the Department of Thoracic Medicine and Surgery. Temple Health is one of the nation's most active, experienced, and innovative lung transplant programs in the United States. Well, Kevin, welcome to our podcast. Morning, Mark. Thank you for having me. Well, please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your current responsibilities. Sure. So my name is Kevin Carney. I'm a nurse practitioner. been a nurse practitioner for a little bit more than 10 years. I've been a nurse for about 25 years Most of my career has been in the pulmonary space, of which the last 20 to 22 years, mostly with patients with advanced lung disease who've often gone on to lung transplant. I practice in the inpatient and the outpatient environment. I also have administrative responsibilities overseeing some advanced practice provider-led inpatient services. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin, for that. Could you describe Temple's lung transplant program and and why is it a leading program and how many transplants do you do? Sure. So lung transplant, if you look at registry data, a median-sized program does between 20 to 30 lung transplants per year. It's a relatively small number. When programs are doing 50 or more cases per year, that really puts them in in the highest tier of programs. You know, since 2018, you know, we've done 700 lung transplants and counting, so about 130 transplants per year, and that's been the highest volume over the last five years by quite a margin. Some of the reasons why our program is is so strong, first, we need to start with our generous donor families. You know, without the donor and the donor family, organ transplant really can't take place. So, we're certainly appreciative of our donors and donor families who've made this who've made this very generous gift. And then from a programmatic perspective, obviously we have very strong surgeons and pulmonologists, but I think what really separates our program from others is the diversity and the multidisciplinary approach that we take. You know, whether you're a nurse, a respiratory therapist, an occupational speech therapist, physical therapist, or a social worker, you know, we really acknowledge one's expertise in that domain and allow them to really practice at the higher, their highest level and help co-direct the care. What types of lung diseases Temple uh, Lung Center treats, and have you done any transplants on COVID patients? Sure. So if you look at registry data, about 30 to 40 percent of patients have COPD about 30 to 40 percent of patients have an interstitial lung disease. About 15 percent of patients who've undergone transplant have cystic fibrosis. And then the, the remaining 10 to 10 to 15 percent have different types of lung diseases. Here at Temple, we do a lot of patients with interstitial lung disease, so pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, and others. That accounts for about 60 percent of our patients. About 30 to 35 percent of our patients have COPD or emphysema, with the remaining number of patients having other types of lung conditions. From a COVID perspective, to date, we've done about 18 lung transplants. So these are patients that may have had an underlying lung condition, not severe enough to be considered for lung transplant, but had COVID that kind of exacerbated their uh, progression of disease and now that they're required a transplant. We've had other young healthy patients with no underlying lung condition develop a very severe COVID infection uh, that did require lung transplant. So about 18 patients to date, all of which are still alive, so doing quite well. Yeah, that's that's just incredible. I mean, from our perspective, you know, the thought of, of a total uh, lung transplant is is almost mind boggling in and of itself. Uh, and yet, as you point out, you you do uh, uh, quite a few of them. You know, given the nature and complexity of that procedure, you know, what kind of success rate per year do you get at Temple with these procedures? Yes, you know, one year and and five year survival continues to improve. When I first started doing lung transplant as a nurse in the late 90s, early 2000s, 
often we would quote a one-year survival of about 70 to 75 percent. Currently, our program has a one-year survival of about 89 percent, which is a little bit better than the than the national average, and uh, also a little bit higher than our expected survival because we tend to operate on patients with a lot of other comorbidities. So one-year survival has really, really improved over these last 20 years. That's great. Do you have a specific means of, or a program that why you're having such a, a successful rate? Is it you're the quality of physicians? What is some of these specifics of why you're, you're doing so well as compared to the rest of the nation? Sure. So, you know, I think transplant as a whole, you know, think about first lung transplant really were kind of done in the early to mid 1990s. So we're really still in the infancy of lung transplant. I think as we've made improvements in the field of lung transplant, as have our colleagues at other centers in the United States and around the world, we've learned from each other. We've learned from recipient selection to donor selection to donor management, surgical techniques. You know, so there's a lot of research that's taking place. Next week, uh, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplant will be meeting in Denver, Colorado. And these are the international experts, physician and non-physician in the area of heart, lung, and heart and lung transplant and others that meet to kind of go over research protocols and clinical updates. So together we'll learn and we'll share our experiences and I'll learn from my colleagues around the world to help move our program forward. Great, that's that's wonderful. Just keeping up with a lot of the, we're so connected throughout the world, it's important to learn about different techniques and, and opportunities that are out there. Well, let's, let's jump into the U.S. organ transplant system. It's been kind of in the news that, that it might be a little outdated or needing some overhaul. Do you have opinion on that? Specific to lung transplant, the lung allocation score, which came about in May of 2005, was a real stepping stone towards better utilization of a very scarce donor pool. Prior to 2005, patients in the United States waited on average about two to two and a half years for a lung transplant. And there was no preference for a condition, say like interstitial lung disease or cystic fibrosis that may be more progressive than a disease like COPD. So the lung allocation score first came about in 2005, and uh, since then we've seen a real increase both in the number of transplants and decrease in waitlist mortality. And that lung allocation score continued to update as, as new variables came along. You know, so the United Network for Organ Sharing, I was uh, on their thoracic committee a number of years ago, but there would always be identifying variables and other outcome measures to help tweak that lung allocation score, really with a focus to try and maximize the use of a very scarce resource, trying to decrease waitlist mortality and try and help as many patients as we can. You know, another big change took place in 2017, where instead of allocating lungs locally, i.e. in in where I practice, if there was a donor in, say, in in southern Pennsylvania, they would try and allocate those lungs to the two adult transplant centers in this area and then the pediatric center for any recipient age 12 or older. Those patients would fall under the lung allocation score. But since 2017, they did away with that local allocation and moved more towards a regional allocation. So the priority in a 250-mile radius from where the, the donor actually is at, the highest patient by lung allocation score would get that first offer. So I think the community has identified patients who really, really need a transplant and try to allocate organs accordingly. Well, that's good to, very good to know. The the lung allocation score, that, that's an interesting concept for me. Uh, we know with the global, you know, shortage of or organ donation and stuff like that, how, how is that formulated? Mm-hmm. You know, kind of what does it mean and predict? So uh, as of 
last month, March of 2023, the lung allocation score is changing to a composite lung allocation score. Under the prior version, the lung allocation score really prioritized patients who were had a high risk of dying without a lung transplant. The new composite lung allocation score will, con will continue to consider the patient's severity of illness and poor prognosis without a lung transplant, but they're also considering other variables for patients younger than age 18 would get additional points. Patients that have a very challenging height, very tall patients or very short patients would get a few points because they, they are harder to try and find organs for them. And patients that have preformed antibodies because of pregnancy or blood transfusion, they would also get a couple of extra points depending on the, the donor. So how is Temple dealing with the transplant agencies and being criticized for donor organs arriving late, damage, or diseases? Do you have some protocols that are set up for that? Sure. From a lung perspective, you know, we work very closely with our organ procurement organizations, both Gift of Life here in the Philadelphia area and partner organ procurement organizations. So we have a pretty good sense on the quality of the donor, some of the donor characteristics that we want to be aware of when we're managing our recipients after transplant. But unlike some other organs, kidneys specifically, we have our own procurement team go to wherever that donor is, and we kind of do our own inspection of the, of the lungs, and then we retrieve the lungs themselves, and, the, and our physicians take the lungs with them. Uh, so we're not dependent on a procuring surgeon outside of our facility or a courier sending these organs. So we're doing our own assessment, our own retrieval, and our own transportation back to Temple. Okay, well, that's very good to know. The One of the things that I've always heard about in, any kind of transplant, of course, is the risk of rejection. What's being done to mitigate those risks, and, and does that open up uh, more options or more potential for people in need of a transplant? So talking about acute rejection, so acute rejection can take place really at any time in the first 12 months. Uh, we know by registry data that about 30 to 40 percent of patients in the first 12 months may have some evidence of acute cellular rejection on a biopsy. Often patients may not have symptoms, so we tend to do biopsies to ensure that there's not any missed acute rejection. But what's important to know that acute rejection doesn't mean that the lung has failed. There are ways that we can treat this acute rejection to try and prevent it from leading towards chronic rejection or lung allograft dysfunction. So the community usually uses what we call induction therapy or medications in the operating room at time of transplant to really decrease the risk of acute rejection that in the immediate perioperative period. Uh, we also use three different types of medications designed to suppress the immune system. So the immune system doesn't do what it's designed to do, and that would be to fight the organ because it's identified it as foreign. And again, I think as we've become more experienced knowing the different phases where complications can occur, we know kind of what to look out for and how to treat that accordingly. We've also made a lot of progress knowing when we can kind of back off on immunosuppression after one year when the incidence of acute cellular rejection is much lower. So again, this is coming together as a community, learning from each other to kind of move lung transplant going forward. So I got another follow-up on that. Is it standard or is it when a patient's in the clear that he's not going to reject these lungs? Is it is it a year? Is it two years? Or have you had people five years down the line uh, reject their lungs? Can you elaborate on that? Great question. So, you know, we know that the incidence of acute rejection can, can take place at any time, but most likely in those first six to 12 months, less likely after a year. So what a lot of centers do at defined intervals, and this is center specific, you know, at our center, it's usually two months, four months, six months, and again, at 12 months, 
where we do a screening lung biopsy. So it's it's a in the bronchoscopy suite where a patient is sedated. We're examining the connection of the new lung to the to the recipient's windpipe, looking at that anastomosis, doing a biopsy just to see if there's any hidden rejection. That's done at that interval for patients that have no symptoms of acute rejection. If patients were more breathless, having a decline in their breathing test, changes on an image, et cetera, et cetera, that may prompt the uh, pulmonologist to do a biopsy sooner. But because rejection is sometimes asymptomatic, sometimes we go looking for that at that interval. So with global shortages of organ donations and how is Temple dealing with these shortages and what's the best thing that people can do to help with the donor program? Sure. I'll start with the second point. So how can we improve the donor pool? I think it's really important for all of us who believe in organ donation. And if you ask, you know, 60 to 70 percent of people, they wholeheartedly believe in organ donation yet they've never taken that step to register as a formal donor. You know, I think having that notification on your license helps, but having an actual donor card at the local OPO, most people don't do that. So I think in reality is having conversations with your family, letting them know, you know, if you believe in organ donation, that if you unfortunately had a, you know, an unexpected death, that you would want to be considered to be an organ donor if it was medically appropriate. From lungs specifically, you know, what we always try and tell patients is, you know, in a perfect world, we would have enough lungs to give to everybody and we would give two lungs more often than not. And we know that around the world, about 70% of all lung transplants are bilateral lung transplants where the recipient receives two lungs. At Temple, realizing that there's such a significant donor shortage And because we try and help as many patients as we can, we do a lot of single lung transplants. So about 75% of our procedures are single lung transplants. Uh, So, you know, our thought is if we can shorten our patient's donor time, if we can shorten our wait list mortality and maximize the number of patients we can help. Great information, Kevin. I suppose one thing that would help is if we all sign our uh, donor cards, uh, give you know, more opportunities out there. So I know that uh, Temple Health Lung Center also hosts the uh, upcoming Gold International COPD Conference. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, maybe how people can get involved? A little bit of background. So Gold, which is a consortium of physician and non-physician experts in the diagnosis and treatment of COPD or obstructive lung disease, international perspective. We really learn from our international colleagues. So they've been around since 1998, and they meet two times per year reviewing kind of all the key papers and update a consensus statement, usually November of each year, where they kind of give guidelines for any clinician treating patients with COPD at any point in their illness. So it's not written for the academic pulmonologist's caring for a patient with end-stage disease. It's written for everybody, including a provider like myself, primary care provider who may be caring for a patient with mild to moderate disease. Usually just prior to the release of the GOLD guidelines, Temple is one of the main sponsors of the GOLD International Conference. So this year it's going to take place on two days. Uh, normally it's been a one day, but what we're trying to do is is expand the program to have a focus for the primary care provider, for the non-physician providers. So it's a two-day conference, November the 13th and then November the 14th. So the, the evening session is kind of really focusing on the non-physician or non-pulmonary providers for the management of COPD. And then the, the full day program, the following day on November the 14th, We'll kind of cover all the up-to-date research and all the up-to-date clinical findings to help our providers. So information is available at Temple Health, so Temple Health Lung Center, or if you Google Gold COPD International Conference, you can see the information on gold. That's tremendous. I I had no idea that you opened that up, that 
not specific doctors. It includes all the physicians and other providers that are out there. That's wonderful. Well, again, we'll probably put that uh, website up on the description for our audience on the podcast so that they can go to a direct link and get more information. Kevin, thank you so much for being on our podcast. We really appreciate it. And this has been a really enlightening. I had no idea about uh, lung transplants and this was really good information. Appreciate it very much. Thanks for having me. Talk soon. Take care. You've reached the end of another episode of the Exhale podcast. Don't forget to follow us for upcoming new episodes and please take our survey to help provide good content for the future. Thank you for listening and we look forward to you joining us again on the Exhale podcast brought to you by Vitalograph. <laughs>